Yu-Gi-Oh! as a franchise has two completely different faces. One is a fun card game for all ages who have infinity time to read and understand each and every one of the Flower Guardians, and the other is a tale of murder, assault, dark games where souls are wagered, and plenty of seedy going-ons that most people are completely unaware of. Today we're going to dive right into that seedy underbelly with the iceberg format that's so popular. All the thanks in the world to at Yu-Gi-Oh!7S on Twitter for providing the list and giving approval for this video. Strap in and prepare to learn a thing or two, because I guarantee you there's at least one thing on this iceberg that, like me, you've never heard of. Season Zero. If it weren't for Jay Witz making a video on this subject, I doubt it'd be this high. But as it is, Season Zero is an anime adaptation of the original Yu-Gi-Oh! manga before the card game is introduced. And it's notable for a massively darker tone with Yu-Gi playing various different games with people that end in them either dying or being destroyed mentally. It's actually a really good read if you want a different look at the characters you know and love, and is going to make in quite a few more appearances on this iceberg. A bridge series. Undoubtedly the most popular fan creation in the history of Yu-Gi-Oh! and the grandfather of a whole genre of internet videos, Yu-Gi-Oh! The Abridged series was created by Little Karibo as a comedic take on the original Duel Monsters anime. It's gone through a lot of changes and hiatuses over the year, and as of time of writing, the series is in its final season. Its impact on internet culture is undeniable, to the point that there's even a reference to it in Duel Links. 2,500 card deck. Also known as the Delinquent Duo, it's a famous image in the Yu-Gi-Oh! community of two guys holding a large deck case with an absurdly sized Yu-Gi-Oh! deck. I'll link to a video by Mega Capital G which goes into more depth than I can, but the short of it is that before the rule was put into place, making it so you could only have 60 cards in your deck, these two decided to play with the rule and come in with a deck consisting of 2,222 cards, which is where the need for the 60 card rule came from. Yu-Gi-Oh! is really charming in that it has one of the dumbest rules in any card game I've ever seen. Missing timing is a mechanic in Yu-Gi-Oh! where if a monster's effect would be activated at a certain time and is interrupted, you'll miss the effect window and the effect will fizzle. If you want to see how this mechanic works, play Yang Zings, an archetype that seemed to really bring into question how pedantic the wording of Yu-Gi-Oh! cards needs to be. What does Pot of Greed do? It's the one you know. It's referring to the meme where people don't understand Pot of Greed's effect despite its simplicity. I thought it was funny until I was at college and some guys were loudly playing Yu-Gi-Oh! and making Pot of Greed jokes so bad that my butthole started to shrivel up in secondhand embarrassment. You're a third rate duelist with a fourth rate deck. Simply referring to the famous line used by Seto Kaiba, used primarily as one of his victory lines in Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links. It's just such an effective put down that not only do you suck, but your cards suck even worse. Tier zero. Final part of the iceberg's tip is Tier Zero, a term in Yu-Gi-Oh! used to define a deck that's so good it makes up more than 80% of the representation at a local event. Examples of different Tier Zero decks throughout Yu-Gi-Oh!'s history include Zodiacs, Performer Pals and Perform Mages, Spirals, and, coming up next... Teledad. Another one of those Tier Zero strategies broken down to its most basic elements, Teledad uses the card Emergency Teleport in order to facilitate the summon of Dark Armed Dragon. It was such an oppressive and overwhelming strategy that the pieces I just mentioned have either been limited ever since or only recently were able to escape the ban list. Yay, the lot. Another Tier Zero strategy, the first one in fact, this time involving Yadagarasu and Chaos Emperor Dragon Envoy of the End. How it worked was that by using Chaos Emperor Dragon's effect, you could get rid of your opponent's whole hand, then by attacking with Yatagarasu, you can lock your opponent out of drawing any more cards. With no cards, there's no way to fight back. It was so strong that they had to significantly change Chaos Dragon's effect to lock you out of all other effects before it was safe to re-release them. Yatagarasu is not so lucky, and to this day is still banned. Music to do by... I miss the days when shows would do terrible things like this. Following Pokemon's success doing the exact same thing, 4Kids released a CD of Yu-Gi-Oh! specific music. Some are songs from the shows, other are songs made for the CD, and one is even a spoken word number by Pegasus. If you want to get slapped with early 2000s cheese, give Yu-Gi-Oh! music to duel by Alyssa. Fire Dragon. One of the most infamous pieces of cut content in Yu-Gi-Oh! history because we actually got to see it, in the Emmy Award-winning GX opening, we can see that Bastion has his ace monster, Water Dragon, as well as another monster. Fire Dragon. In his 10 duels across GX, he never once summons or even references a Fire Dragon. So we can assume that he was meant to have a Fire Dragon, but it was cut later on, much like Bastion. You see a milk. Not much to say here, in the dub of 5Ds, when they were going to a bar, Yusei orders milk instead of beer. 
It was immortalized and mocked in Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links when it was made one of Yusei's taunt lines. Zero Rivers. This is referring to the event in Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds where the energy reactor that powered New Domino City is flooded with dark energy and explodes, destroying the city and killing all of its inhabitants. The pole position loop is fake. This is going to be a tough one to explain, so let's keep it simple. There's a card called Pole Position that in the right circumstances can create an infinite loop situation. The confusion on how exactly the loop works is debated hotly in the fandom, and has led to some claiming that the loop isn't even a real thing. It's an unspoken rule amongst duelists, however, to just not even try it because it's going to cause more headaches than it's worth. Outstanding Dog Warrior, Die Grapper Warrior of Zero. I'm lumping all three of these together as they're all fairly low-stakes stories that set up a concept in Yu-Gi-Oh! That is that there are collections of cards that can tell stories across several different versions of their art. For Outstanding Dog, it's the story of a dog getting lost and waiting for his owner, only to have his heart fall to darkness, die, then be adopted by a skeleton family. Warrior Digrefers is the story of a warrior whose life can go down two very different paths depending on what cards you play. Either he rises above darkness to become Night Digrefer, or loses himself to darkness and becomes Dark Lucius. Warrior of Zeras is my personal favorite, and another version of Digrefer's story, with a warrior trying to reach heaven, which he ends up succeeding at. But you can also have him go to the Underworld and become a Demon Lord. Do more research for yourself if this sounds interesting, because there are tons more just like this. You still take the damage. I'm aiming the fandom revolving around the... Poor writing of Arc V's second half, where, like Pot of Greed drawing two cards, characters constantly remind each other that defense position monsters don't accept them from damage via piercing damage. It was repeated so often that the fans eventually grew very sick of the phrase and the writing staff were recycling it so often. Cypher Soldier. It is a good thing I did my research on this, otherwise, I would have been completely off. Originally, I had assumed that this was about Kinetic Soldier being renamed to Cypher Soldier when the Cypher archetype was revealed. This happens pretty often with monsters who have different names in America than they do in Japan. Come to find out that the second printing of Cypher Soldier listed it as a light monster, when in reality it's supposed to be an earth monster. So for a whole rotation set, that meant that Cypher Soldier was a light monster, but in the next set they changed it back. The tomato episode. A lot of episodes in early Zexal are very lighthearted, and this happens to be one of them, with the episode being based around a duelist who uses its tomato cards, and Yuma being forced to eat them despite hating them. It's a really, really weird episode, and I'm sure a lot of people quit Zexal around this point thinking it was just going to be a lot more of this. Imagine how they felt when the genocide plotline got introduced. Last turn. A card so confusing and broken that it ended up in so many unwinnable circumstances, and eventually ended up just getting banned altogether. The card reads, this card can only be activated on your opponent's turn when your life points are 1,000 or less. Select one monster on your side of the field and send all other cards on the field and in the respective owner's hands to the graveyard. After that, your opponent selects one monster to special summon from their deck in face-up attack position and attacks your selected monster. The player whose monster remains alone on the field at the end phase of this turn wins the duel. Any other case results in a draw. Used in conjunction with a card like Fossil Dino Pachycephalo, that means that your opponent would completely be locked out of special summoning a monster, meaning that they wouldn't have anything on the field, meaning that you'd automatically win. Numbered monster cards. I, I don't know what this is referring to. Do, do you mean the number monsters? Like, from Zexel? Are you talking about, like, monsters that are numbered? Like, Yosenju, comma, one, two, and three? Uh, uh, this one stumped me. Magic cards. Following a lawsuit from Wizards of the Coast over Yu-Gi-Oh! having cards called Magic Cards and a set called Magic Ruler when they were making a card game called Magic the Gathering, all instances of magic were replaced with spell, and re-releases of Magic Ruler were called Spell Rulers. Black with your favoritism. Keep this one in your back pocket. We're getting back to it. It's the blue hair girl from Season Zero. Originally a part of the core gang, she was phased out when switching over from Season Zero to Duel Monsters. Our Peace Brother. The OCG card Sky Scout was incorrectly translated as Harpy's Brother when coming to English speaking countries and as a result had its name changed back to the original version when more Harpy cards were made. Frog the Jam. A similar situation, except for years, any Frog cards had to specifically exclude Frog the Jam from their text due to the confusion. This also happened with the card Red Eyes Black Chick. References to Konami. 
Cards like Gradius, Tactical Espionage Expert, and Goe Goe the Gallant Ninja are all references to other Konami properties, like Gradius, Metal Gear, and Goemon. Ashio, Duel Masters the 5DS. In Yu-Gi-Oh! Season Zero and Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters, a bully named Ushio harasses Yuki and beats up Joey and Tristan. In 5Ds, a cop named Ushio harasses Yusei before joining the heroes. It was later confirmed by Kazuki Takahashi that the Season Zero Ushio is the same Ushio as in Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds. Just a really funny image of Zane from Yu-Gi-Oh! GX claiming to be the best duelist at the Academy before summoning a flip monster in attack position taken from the classic GBA game Yu-Gi-Oh! GX Duel Academy. Duelists carry the rules. That is to say, no rules. Duelist Kingdom is filled with bizarre rulings based on the field, attacking the moon, destroying flotation rings, and aging monsters into stone. Any attempt to play with this rule set in the real world will result in a headache. Jesse Wheeler. A throwaway joke from the dub. In an episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds, a character with a strong resemblance to Joey Wheeler is referred to as Jesse Wheeler, his cousin. Try harder next time. Is that Joey Wheeler? No, man, it's a cousin Jesse Wheeler. Mad Dog. The single most infamous change from the original show to the dub. In the original, Mad Dog is a grizzled underground duelist who enjoys inflicting pain. In the dub... That's why, Poopy Ed! My mommy says I'm really strong! Rejected players. There was a contest held by 4Kids to create an opening for the 5Ds dub. A total of 8 were preserved and are available to listen on YouTube. I wouldn't recommend it though, as they're all really bad, except for Rev It Up, Ride to Survive, and of course, the winner. Cards based on anime characters. I could go on about this for hours, but I'll keep it brief. Yu-Gi-Oh! loves making cards featuring characters from the anime in some form. A short list of this includes The Lord of Red being Joey from Duel Monsters, Crystal Bonds showing Jesse Anderson from GX, Blackbird Glow showing Crow Hogan from 5Ds, and Numeral Hunter being Kite from Zexel. Duel Terminal. The big one. This is taking the plot lines we discussed in Outstanding Dog and cranking it up to 100. It was a multi-year story told over dozens and dozens of packs, spanning from the beginning of 5Ds to the ending of Arc 5. Thankfully, the plot holes been explained more in Master Guides, which embellish a little more on the details of the world and give us more context for who the characters are and why they're fighting. I'd love to make a separate video explaining just the lore around this one story, but understand that in that one story, the world ends about three separate times. The follow-up story to the Duel Terminal, it follows a new group of characters collecting the seven world legacy pieces to save the world. This only lasted for the whole of the Vrains era, but the archetypes made in it, including Mech Knights, Orcus, and Crusadia, are all still frequently played in the main game. The Galen Special. Another funny dub line. When escaping from bad guys in a minecart, Callan prepares the Callan Special. Up, you want a taste of the Callan Special? Just like Yusei's milk, this has been made one of his taunts at Duel Links. Physical interaction. There are a select group of cards that require players to touch each other in order to resolve their effects. Yujo Friendship requires each player to shake hands in order to activate its effect. The workaround is that you only need to accept the idea of shaking somebody's hand, not actually shake their hand. You just summoned your mom. If you can believe it, this is a line in both the original and dub versions, referring to Nelson Andrews of Zexel summoning Galaxy Queen, and the monster looking like his overbearing mother. Slifer is named after an executive. It sure is. Kaiser Coliseum. Why is this one on the list? Is it because the, the effect's confusing? Anyway, it's a banned card that got banned because of Bujin's, a deck I love. I'm banning you cowards! Or at least let make like a Bujin specific version of it. Mr. Clown. Duke Devlin's father from the manga, who had Duke exclusively to get revenge on Grandpa Moto, who he challenged to a shadow game in order to get the Millennium Puzzle. After failing, he got aged 50 years in one night. He also appears in the Dark Side of Dimensions movie. Series 1 card layout. The original Japanese printing of Yu-Gi-Oh cards had a much smaller text box with much larger art, but eventually it got updated to the modern layout that we use now. The Zexel Shadow Game. Zexel indeed had a dual monster-styled shadow game, 
We're in the duel between Vector and Nash. Vector wagered the lives of both their armies in a duel, where a monster destroyed equal a portion of their army being killed. It's one of the very few instances of a good old-fashioned shadow game past duel monsters, but given the time it's taking place in, it actually fits. I'll go with this guy, Yaga Giko. Another card storyline following a small creature falling into darkness before being defeated, coming back as a cyborg, going out of control before finding justice once again. It's without a doubt the single most popular card storyline, involving other monsters too like Freed the Matchless General and Marauding Captain. Ten thousand dragon. The intentionally rarest card right now is the Ten Thousand Dragon, released to commemorate ten thousand unique cards being produced. Made very famous by Moist Critical's fruitless pursuit of it, baby, because we're gonna get nothing. <laughs> In the final battle of Yu-Gi-Oh! Season Four, Darts, the main antagonist, summons Divine Serpent Geth with Infinity Attack. Unfortunately for Darts and all math majors in the audience, Yugi creates Tamias, the Knight of Destiny, who can attack with a force beyond infinity. The phrase beyond infinity went on to become a meme in the Yu-Gi-Oh! fandom. Nephew. In the original Yu-Gi-Oh! manga's Kaiba Land arc, we meet Tristan's young nephew. He's a lecherous, cursing baby with a gun and is constantly in a duck costume. Shockingly, he has not appeared in any form outside of this one manga. DM City Abort Dub! A fairly low quality dub of the Duel Monsters anime made for Singapore. It's unique for using the uncensored original Japanese card art as well as the Japanese score, but what it's most known for is. Hey, looking good, dude! GX Italian Play. Italians love themselves some Yu Gi Oh for some reason, so much so that outside of Japan, this was the only country to not use the original theme made by four kids redubbed for that region. Some dubbed over it, some spoke over it, Arabic countries just went with an instrumental, but Italy went the extra mile and made their own theme song. Adult player in 5Ds. In a crowd shot of cheerleaders rooting for the master of faster, Jack Atlas, one girl shares a resemblance to the GX character Blair Flanagan. Given the time difference between GX and 5Ds, it's not impossible that it's the same girl. A manga-only continuation of the Duel Monster story, following Yugi and his friends in his fight against the Wicked Gods and Pegasus's adopted son. Kaiba swore crimes. I mean, Kaiba did make an MMO using the souls of dead kids. I'd say that's grounds for a war crime. In the Dark Side of Dimensions prequel manga, Kaiba creates a pseudo duel links using the minds of the children trapped inside the Plana, which angers Sarah, a major character in both the manga and movie. Way because original text. Simply put, Waboku is one of the few cards in the game that's had its actual effect changed between printings. In the original printing, Waboku would prevent you from taking battle damage, but later printings added the effect that Waboku could protect your monsters from destruction. Don't know why this isn't next to Cypher Soldier. The left and right theory. Bad duelists are always placed on the left side of the screen, while good duelists are always placed on the right side of the screen. Why is that? Well, it's a holdover from Kabuki Theater, where the same system is used to easily determine who the good and bad guys in the scene are. And that's why duelists are always arranged this way. Convulsions of Nature. One of the most infamous cards in the game, Convulsion of Nature has the effect to flip your deck upside down so that you see what you're going to draw next. It became infamous on the dueling site Dueling Book. With no option to flip your deck manually, each player had to painstakingly flip their cards one by one, resulting in many players quitting at just the sight of this card. Dungeon Dice Monsters. There was a big push by Konami to make Dungeon Dice Monsters a real thing. Not only was a video game released, but a genuine board game too, as well as an arc in the anime. For those curious, there's a Jay Witz video all about this that goes into more depth than I ever could. in episode one. Yeah, I, I I don't know what this is talking about. I combed through the whole of Arc 5's first episode and didn't see any hints of Zark. Maybe I'm just not looking hard enough. Yugi's Mom. Yugi's Mom is only ever seen in one episode of Duel Monsters, in the filler episode where Yugi goes on a date with Taya. It's unknown why she doesn't play a bigger role, but probably because Grandpa fills both the role of a duelist and a parental figure better than her. Sawatari's Underground Duel. During the Friendship Cup of Arc 5, lovable jerk Sawatori is sent to an underground labor camp, where he's challenged to a duel, though we never hear about how this duel pans out. Sawatori defeats Zark. 
A popular discussion regarding Arc 5 revolves around the much derided final duel where all the main characters team up to fight the main villain, Zark. After everybody else falls, Sawatori is the only one left to duel. Despite everybody beforehand losing to Zark handily, Sawatori is able to overcome Zark's various made-up effects and land a killing blow, only for Zark to pull another explanation for his survival out of his butt. Everybody in the fandom agrees that without that one card, Sawatori would have saved reality. A scrapped storyline from the Egyptian arc of dual monsters, the priest Seta was originally intended to betray Atem in order to protect his love Kisara, the embodiment of the Blue Eyes White Dragon. This ended up never happening and Kazuki Takahashi has expressed regret over it. On to the final murky piece, and... it's not a happy one. If stories about real children suffering disturb or upset you, please skip ahead. But if you're still here, let me tell you the story of Tyler the Great Warrior. Fourteen-year-old Tyler Gressel is diagnosed with liver cancer, a rare form called undifferentiated embryonal sarcoma. A mass in Tyler's liver had burst, causing him immense pain, and the doctor ended up removing 25% of Tyler's liver, six inches of his large intestine, and his gallbladder. While this was happening, the Make-A-Wish Foundation worked together with four kids to allow Tyler to create a card all by himself. With a paper and pencil, he created Tyler the Great Warrior. Inspired by trunks from Dragon Ball Z and named after himself, Konami provided him with the card, with the unique set number of Tyler 1. Thankfully, Tyler survived his operation and has made a full recovery, and was even able to tour the four kids' office where Yu-Gi-Oh! is produced. In a recent interview, he confirmed that he still has the card. It's both a tragic and heartwarming story, all capsulated in this now iconic card. Originally when introduced to the story, Crow Hogan was meant to become a Dark Signer, brought in to pilot an Earthbound deck, and then leave the story. However, in his introduction, the Black Wings proved so popular that the course of the story had to be changed. Now Crow became a Signer, Black Winged Dragon was made his ace monster, and was retroactively put back into scenes with the other Signer Dragons where he originally wasn't. This also massively pushed back when Leo became a Signer until the end of the story. Goes to show when a third of your archetype can special summon itself, you can go far in this business. In Yu-Gi-Oh! Vrains, the sentient computer programs called the Ignis need to link up with a human avatar in order to survive. I had Playmaker, Aqua had Blue Angel, Flame had Soulburner, so on and so forth. That is of course for the exception, which is Windy, who ended up making his partner. It's later revealed in a duel against Revolver that it's very likely that Windy killed his partner in the real world as to not be bound to a human. Level zero, rank 13. These both refer to anime and real-world monsters who go either all out or not at all in terms of their level and or rank. Examples of the offending monsters include Phantasmal Lord Ultimaya Bishbalkin, Ultimaya Tzolkin, and number IC1000 Numeronius Numeronia, who just so happens to fall into the next category. 100,000 attack! In the finale of Yu-Gi-Oh! Zexel, when Don Thousand's number C-1000 Numeronia is destroyed, it brings out number IC-1000 Numeronius Numeronia, with a whopping 100,000 attack points. This is the highest amount naturally on any card in any form of Yu-Gi-Oh! media, only beat by Utopia doubling its own attack with a spell card double or nothing. The Zexel and Dark Five Raps. I am so happy I couldn't find anything about these. Although ArcV's opening is a rap, I can't find any promo rap made by Nicktoons for Zexel or ArcV. If you have any evidence of something like this, just keep it to your goddamn selves, I don't want to hear about it. Guardian Elma. Along with elemental hero Neo Bubble Man, Guardian Elma is completely unsummonable due to the fact that it requires a banned card to summon itself. In this case, Butterfly Dagger Elma. There are ways to cheat it out with a card like a wild monster appears, but on its own, it's a monster that you cannot summon. Ever. In the anime, during his final battle against Darkness, Jaden Yuki uses Super Polymerization to fuse his Neos and Yubel, but in the real game, it's a main deck monster requiring the tribute of the two monsters instead of a fusion. However, there do exist misprints of the card in the Korean version of the game that mislabel it as a fusion monster, and it's even available for purchase. However, with the recent announcement of Elemental Hero Neos Kluger, this now sits firmly at the top of the iceberg because, well, it's just something that exists now. Slice drop storyline. It's set up early on that one of Leo's classmates named Sly in Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds is obsessed with the Stardust Dragon and says he'll do anything to take it away from Yusei. This goes nowhere and is forgotten. 
In fact, Sly ends up helping Yusei later on by giving him Eccentric Boy and asks for nothing in return. Leo Institute of Dueling War Crimes. The Leo Institute of Dueling and Arc V performed horrible war crimes on several occasions, including attacking civilians, attempts at extermination, and brainwashing. It's just so jarring to see how much the Leo Institute completely devastates the Xyz dimension, even innocent people so that he can reconnect the dimensions and hopefully save his daughter. Capsule Monsters In an attempt to capture the charm of Pokemon, and much like with Dungeon Dice Monsters, Konami tried really hard to push Capsule Monsters, with a video game and even an anime miniseries. And it didn't work. At all. Infernities Infernities are one of the most powerful archetypes ever introduced into the game, mainly down to their effects that can be used more than once per turn, and their gimmick being to empty their hand to get their effects. But what if you can't empty your hand? That's when some Infernity players choose to just cheat and set their monsters in the spell and trap zone, then quickly pick them up when the duel's over to avoid being discovered. Some may even say that this would serve as inspiration for the artifact archetype that came soon after Infernities. Magic and Wizards Viz, for some odd reason, used the name Magic and Wizards to refer to the Yu-Gi-Oh card game in early drafts of the manga rather than Duel Monsters, and was used in some foreign language translations like the Italian translation. Eve's Legendary Monsters In the Arc 5 manga, the main villain Eve wants to bring out the power of the Genesis Omega Dragon, and does it with three legendary monsters. Phantasm Emperor Trilogig, Time Lord Progenitor Volgate, and number XX Utopic Dark Infinity. All three of these monsters are references to previous shows, Trilogig being Armitile the Chaos Phantom from GX, Time Lord Progenitor Volgate being one of Zone's monsters, and Utopic Dark Infinity being one of Astral's Utopia monsters from Zexel. Light of Destruction Bloodline Dropped Both Seasons 2 and 3 of GX lean heavily on the Light of Destruction and Jaden's Gentle Darkness as core conflicts. By the end of Season 3, they don't really stop the light, it just sort of stops being a problem. And then it moves on to Darkness being the bad guy, despite Darkness being shown as not that bad. The God I think this one is referring to Halakti, the creator of light from the final season of Duel Monsters? It might also just be from fans wanting an Egyptian god fusion. Frankly, this one left me stumped. Adult Bracelet Girls Again, this one's a, like a complete mystery. Is this like a manga thing? Is this about Yuya being his own dad? I'm stumped. Being Declan's mom and Leo's husband, you'd think Himiki would play a larger role, and she might have at one point. She was in charge of establishing multiple academies across the world, but the cluster F that was Arc 5's production most likely put a stop to any plans for her. Uh, our friend Ushio makes a second appearance on this list, as in GX he appears on a list of names in Season 4's of Victims of Truman. Fun fact, Miho no Saka from Season 0 is also on this list. Two dark magician girls in complete text. This is the perfect way to track the progression of problem-solving card text in Yu-Gi-Oh! Here's two dark magician girls' current effect, and here's its original effect. At one point, this card had the most text on it out of any card in the game. It had to fit so much poorly worded language related to the mechanics of Toon Monsters that it excluded the monster's actual effect to gain attack based on how many Dark Magicians were in the graveyard. Normal monsters, Zera the Mant. There exist OCG versions of Zera the Mant where it's a normal monster, despite it being a ritual monster in both the original manga and anime. A version of this also exists for Super War Lion and the Blackluster Soldier. These were handed out as prize cards, however, so it makes sense that they weren't intended for real play. Henry Tudor. In the PS2 spin-off Yu-Gi-Oh! Duelists of the Roses, characters assume the roles of historical figure from France's War of the Roses. Henry Tudor is the persona that Yu-Gi adopts, although he eventually gets tired of the name and insists everybody just refer to him as Yu-Gi. Best protagonists in Arc 5. With Arc 5 being a series all about dimension hopping back to the other series and meeting up with characters like Jack Atlas, Astro Phoenix, and Kai Tenjo, the question has to be raised, where are all the protagonists from these shows? For GX, it's implied that this is just a world sans Jaden, and it's reasonable to assume that Yuma was killed in the raids performed by Leo. But what about Yusei and Yugi? 
Now we get to the unfun portion, which is where we explain it using, like, real-world logic, and if you're going to try to push a new main character, it's probably not a good idea to bring back the other established and more beloved main characters to go alongside him. The day I it is a crying shame that this is just a dub change, but the main stadium and 5Ds used for many of the duels in the first portion of the story is called the Memorial Circuit in the Japanese version, where the dub changed it to the Kaiba Dome in order to coincide with other sports arena with branded names, like the Smoothie King and Staples Center. The Wicked Gods. Hailing from Yu-Gi-Oh! R, the Wicked Gods are meant to parallel the Egyptian gods and become even stronger. The Wicked Dreadroot is the parallel to Obelisk, the Wicked Eraser is Slifer, and the Wicked Avatar is Ra. They're somehow even less playable than the god cards. Spectre's treatment in Season 3. Oh, this one hurts. Spectre from Vrains is one of my favorite characters, and genuinely interesting for his undying devotion to the Knights of Hanoi and their leader Revolver. He's shown to also be a very powerful duelist, with his son Avalon cards capable of performing the most difficult feat for a Link deck to perform, the Extra Link. That being said, in Season 3 they took a pair of scissors and chopped his balls right off. Just look at the difference in length between his Seasons 1 and 2 articles to his Season 3 article on the wiki. It was such an odd choice to completely neuter this once respected duelist and reduce him to little more than a background character. Pegasus dies in 5Ds. Sad but true, in Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds, the Speed Duel Tournament is being sponsored by the Pegasus J. Crawford Memorial Foundation. And they don't make memorial foundations for people who are still alive. Zane Truesdale, or Ryu Marafuji in the Japanese version, was mentioned in passing in the Fusion Dimension arc of Arc 5. That means that while Zane exists in this dimension, he apparently was shunted so he could get more Destiny heroes. The Burning Abyss Pendulum Monster. I'm lumping in the Fire Fist archetype with this one as they both lack a Pendulum Monster. They've got all the other extra deck summoning mechanics, including rituals, fusions, synchros, Xyz, even Link monsters, but no Pendulums. Now why they haven't made a Fire Fist Pendulum Monster that also counts as a Fire Formation spell is beyond me, but the Burning Abyss Pendulum Monster makes a little more sense, as the archetype's gimmick revolves around hating spell cards, and having a monster who is a spell card would be kinda moot. Poison Butterfly Legendary Dragon's Fusion in order to get the leg up during his duel against Weevil Underwood in Season 4 of Duel Monsters, Yugi attempts to fuse the Poison Butterfly on his side of the field with the Eye of Tamias. This ends up creating a lock as Poison Butterfly and Tamias can't fuse. This proceeds to never be a problem for Yugi ever again, fusion summons with Tamias and all manner of nonsense. This also has led fans to wonder what the fusion would have looked like had it have gone through. Season Zero Video Game if there is one, or ever was one in development, the info is either lost to time, or lost to me. Put it in the no idea category. Mokuba survives being poisoned. This one comes from that no good nasty manga again, where in which a game of poison roulette, Mokuba challenges Yugi and Joey to eat food them with one food poisoned. Mokuba ends up eating the poison food with his butler desperately trying to give him the antidote. Yeah, manga Mokuba's kinda cold-blooded. The Negra Strap Card. I suggested this one to be put on the iceberg, so score one for me. Necros Trap Card refers to a whole class of cards, referring to cards that don't exist. Necros of Clausulus refers to Necros spell and trap cards, of which there are no Necros trap cards. Same deal with Cyber Dark Claw. Rise of the Salamangrates lets you summon any Salamangrate ritual monster. Well, one of them. Most infamous of all at the moment, Eldlixers say that if you control no zombie monsters, you can only summon Eldlich monsters. There's only one Eldlich monster. Magi, Magi, Magician Girl in the DCG. An Xyz version of the Dark Magician Girl that is forever locked away in Japan. Like all Magician Girl cards, it showed a little too much of a booby. And when asked to censor the art, Kazuki Takahashi said, No, never again shall I hide from the world the glories of the nipple. As such, Magi Magi Magician Girl has never and will never be released in America, or any other territory for that matter. Atticus Rhodes is one of the most hotly requested characters for the super popular mobile game Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links. 
Despite appearing for an event recounting the story of GX, Atticus has never been added, and as the plan is right now, he won't be for a while. In the final episode of GX, when Jaden travels to duel Yugi, he finds a flyer saying that there was a second Battle City tournament, and that Yugi won again. He, however, still has all the God cards both here and in his duel with Jaden, so its place in canon is hotly disputed. Evenly matched reprint. No idea where this one came from. Considering Evenly Matched is one of the best cards ever made, this could just be wishful thinking from some people who want it for cheaper. Or maybe it was reported at one point being reprinted as a common card before being rescinded. The Bandai Card Game. Before everybody's favorite game developer Konami got their greasy mitts on Yu-Gi-Oh!, the task with creating a card game originally fell to Bandai. As such, several versions of classic Duel Monster monsters were also created with Bandai versions, with altered arts, stats, and a rule set. GX Card Almanac. Not sure exactly why this one is ranked so low, it's just a compendium of all cards released up until Strike of Neos, and has a little calculator to keep track of life points in a real-life duel. This could be based on the fact that this game was marketed as a game and not an almanac, but at the same time, you can read the back of the box and find out what it is. It could also be argued that this is a precursor to the app Yu-Gi-Oh! Neuron, which is currently being made and supported by Konami for phones. The Baryan Observer. A character cut from Yu-Gi-Oh! Zexal, the Baryan Observer would have been somebody removed from the Baryan Wars, who acted as an overseer, who Kite would have contacted for information on how to beat them. He is only ever mentioned in the preview for episode 130. It's theorized that when cutting this scene for Kite, they replaced it with his duel against Mizar on the moon. Chaos Eos Ghost Rare Misprint. One of the rarest cards ever made, and it was made on complete accident. There are certain printings of the Ghost Rare Chaos Neos that replace its name with that of Rainbow Dragon. This has made it one of the most sought after cards in the whole game. A shield in Astral. Ladies and gentlemen, we got a triple Ushi on our hands! If it weren't for some random research that I was doing one day, I'd have completely written this off as a joke entry. But lo and behold, there is a scene where we get a crowd shot of Astral World, and we can clearly see one of the citizens looks like Ushio. This guy just sure does get around, doesn't he? Legend of Blue Eyes format. This could mean either one of two things. Either it's referring to the actual format where in which you only use cards from the Legend of the Blue Eyes White Dragon booster pack, or it's referring to the time that Blue Eyes won Worlds in 2016 with the help from Konami by releasing busted support for the deck and also neutering the format of World Championship duels with a new ban list. Mismatch Pendulum Scales. Pendulum monsters have two scales on either side of their pendulum effect. This seems tailored to finally have a monster with scales that don't match, like a 3 in the right column and a 4 in the left. However, no such monster exists. Four kids uncut up. I wish there were more of these. Years before Dragon Ball Z Kai, Yu-Gi-Oh! released a set of DVDs featuring the voice cast redoing scenes from the first couple episodes of Duel Monsters, now much more seasoned in their roles, with dialogue more specific to the original Japanese version, the Japanese score, and uncensored card text. I joked, but this really could be seen as a precursor to Kai in a lot of ways, and is well worth a watch if you want to see Yu-Gi-Oh! like you've never seen it before. And I swell in soul tech. Oh, would you look at that, kids? A brain storyline that goes nowhere. Let's move on. Anime timeline. This graph right here is a fan creation dictating where and how exactly the timelines diverge and reconnect for the events of Arc 5. It's out of date now since it excludes both Reigns and Sevens, but it's still interesting to see what went into theorycrafting a timeline like this for a series that plays so fast and loose with time. Lost Exile Dub. Do not research. Normally I roll my eyes when I see do not research topics on an iceberg. But guys, this one's actually real. During Zexel's production, Gallup and Niho Ad Systems discovered that four kids had unreported earnings based on the Yu-Gi-Oh! license and motioned to sue them. This event ended up bankrupting four kids, and as a result, a new company, Bang Zoom, was given the go-ahead to dub Zexel instead. As a show of good faith, Bang Zoom was given unprecedented access to the files of animation, allowing them to touch up aspects of the animation, which Sexel certainly needed sometimes. While the dub was still being produced, however, four kids just went and won the lawsuit, restructuring as 4K media, and as such, the Bang Zoom dub has never been released. A total of 26 episodes were produced with the new cast, including voice acting greats like Johnny Young Bosch, Richard Cancino, and also Vic Mignano was there. 
All the remains of the dub is a test demo reel showed to investors and channels for a potential broadcast, shown at a convention, and the theme song sung by Johnny Young Bosch, which is dog rough. I can't believe it, but for once, one of these do not research topics on an iceberg actually ended up to be true. You're going to have to excuse the length on some of these because there's just not a lot to work with here, so I'm just giving you the facts. Given the fact there's an Ignis for every other attribute in the game, a Divine one just sort of makes sense. However, they've made sure to limit the Divine attribute to only Obelisk the Tormentor, Slay for the Sky Dragon, and all 100 of Ra's awful support cards. Mysterious boy, bro, no. Much like the Baryan Observer, Proto is a character mentioned in his Exile preview who never ended up actually showing up in the show. Except we know even less about Proto than we knew about the Baryan Observer. Praise for I have no clue. background of the card kind of looks like a Neo space, and it's summoned against Jaden by Darkness in the final duel of GX. Duel Monsters versus GX. A rejected film pitch from Kazuki Takahashi after his dissatisfaction with the Manzinger Z vs. Devilman crossover from when he was a child. The film would revolve around a man named Sartorius traveling to Domino City in order to defeat Yugi, with Jaden in tow to stop him. While the movie never saw the light of day in any form outside of concept, Sartorius was retooled in becoming GX's second season villain. Create a current pole body. In the god-given year of 2020, Konami of America had the great idea and allowed fans on Twitter to choose an archetype to get a single card of support made by fans. In the first round matchup of Valkyries vs. Insectors, Valkyries took a commanding lead. A little too commanding for some. Further investigation into Facebook pages revealed that Valkyrie fans were buying poll bots in order to pad out their numbers. Once Konami caught wind, the tournament was restarted on a more secure polling service, and the archetype screwed over by the polling bots, Insectors, went on to win the whole thing. Ito Pro was an inside job. The popular online fan-made dueling simulator, Ito Pro, gives people something that Konami seems to have no interest in giving us, an online deck builder and duel simulator with all cards in the game available from the beginning. However, some have grown more suspicious of the program and claim that it's actually developed by Konami themselves and released as a fan project. The, Roma Sophie cult. the most that Yu Gi Oh has ever been affected by real life happenings. This was an incident so big it nearly derailed the entire 5D's anime. The Roma Sophie cult was a husband and wife operated cult in Japan, mainly used as a money siphoning tool. The cult was outed in 2011 when escapees leaked that the cult would often beat members for hours with wooden sticks as a disciplinary measure. One of the cult's members was Satomi Toyohara, or Li Ming Chang as she's also known. She was the Japanese voice actor for the character Carly Carmine, who was Jack Atlas's love interest. Following her outing as a cult member, albeit more as a victim than as a perpetrator, and Japan's stigmatization of cults, she was fired and replaced by Aki Kanada. As well as in the real world, this had ramifications for the plot of 5Ds as a whole. Carly's role was massively scaled back to being just one of Jack's potential love interests, and a plotline involving Akiza taking down Sayer's psychic cult was scrapped due to the connotations. Genocide is present in every series. It's one of those things that you don't realize until looking into it, but genocide is either a theme or present in every single Yu-Gi-Oh! series. Darts nearly wipes out the whole population of Earth in the Waking the Dragons arc of Duel Monsters, the Greedy GX does it twice in the U-Bell and Darkness arcs, 5Ds has the Mechlord Genocide, which leaves only four cyborgs alive in the future, Zexel has a three-way race on who can be genocided the quickest in Astroworld, Baryans, and the Human Race. Arc 5's Leo Akaba in his genocide extravaganza of the Zexel Dimension, and a plotline in Brains is all about exterminating a race of living and thinking computer programs in the Ignis. I know Sevens is still very much in its infancy as a show, but just don't get attached to the background characters. Permanent deaths in the GX dub. For as much as people talk about changes in the GX dub that remove death, 
there are plenty of implications of horrible deaths in the GX dub. Titan is torn apart by shadows while begging for his life, Thelonious Viper's son dies of a disease, speaking of whom, Thelonious Viper is killed by Yubel, Camilla is turned into dust by her own spirit gate, and Banner's homunculus body is destroyed. For every kidnapped or missing, there are some actual, genuine, hardcore deaths in the GX dub. Pendulums in frames. Konami's got this really bad habit of crapping on pendulum monsters at every single available opportunity. Pendulums are the only summoning mechanic to never appear in Yu-Gi-Oh! Vrains, who made a point of including every single other summoning method. Even Rituals got to play, but for some reason not Pendulums. Roku is a minor character in Zexel who acts as a mentor to Yuma following his first loss to Kite. He lives in a secluded part of the forest in a temple surrounded by statues of famous dual monster and GX cards. It's never even so much as hinted at, but fans have theorized that Roku is a much older Yugi Moto. Evidence includes the very existence of the statues of the monsters like Dark Magician and Blue Eyes, the eyes of Widget littered all around the temple, and his speech about respecting and feeling the souls of your monsters. Not only that, but Roku's non-statue deck is packed with Yugi cards, like the Playing Card Knights, Polymerization, Mirror Force, and even one of Yugi's ace monsters, the Black Luster Soldier. OCG tournament winners are turned into cards. Not in the Pegasus way, rather, winners of early Yu-Gi-Oh tournaments in Japan earned the chance to have a card made with their face over a pre-existing monster. This is how we got cards like this, this, and this. Face down attack position. If you're just a casual Yu-Gi-Oh player or just an anime fan, first off, how have you made it this far? Second off, the term face-down attack position monster probably sounds really dirty. Monsters can typically only be played in face-up attack position or face-down defense position. However, there is a single card that can facilitate face-down attack position. Darkness Approaches made you discard two cards to change a monster to face-down position, without changing its battle position. Aside from being terrible, this card's text saying without changing battle position meant that an attack position monster would be changed to face-down attack position. Sadly, with the advent of the defenseless Link monsters, Darkness Approaches was changed so that it only switched them to face-down defense position, meaning that face-down attack position is no longer possible. Darkness predicted the next three series. This one is a real tough one to accept, and I'll admit there are some parts of it that don't make much sense, but there is a little bit of truth to it. In the final duel of GX, Darkness mentions several factors back-to-back, -back, starting with the card creating the universe, abnormal weather, unnatural occurrences, unstoppable conflict, and terrorism. Somehow, whether on accident or on purpose, these correlate with the next three and potentially four series after GX. The hardest one to associate is abnormal weather. But if you're really, really trying, you could say that the data storms and rains count as abnormal weather? I swear the rest are a lot better. Unnatural occurrences refer to the energy reactor corruption and explosion, creating the Zeroverse, resulting in the destruction of Domino City. Being a man-made explosion, it's as far from natural as you can get. A card creating the universe and unstoppable conflict are both for Zexel, as the Dumeron Code was a card containing all knowledge and was the first thing to ever exist, just like Darkness said. And unstoppable conflict in this case are the Baryans fighting with Astral World. Finally, terrorism is, is Leo Akabe again. It's like the third or fourth time his genocide has been put on the list. Call it a stretch, but the fact that they line up at all is just kind of spooky. Yugi versus Jaden was all a dream. The final duel of GX is Yugi versus Jaden in what's meant to be a passing of the torch moment. But to save face for both protagonists, the match ends in mystery. According to fans, due to the strange atmosphere of the game and the several, several misplays that Jaden makes, people have come to the conclusion that it might have just all been a dream. The seal of courage shall go real but to steal souls. In the anime, the card the Seal of Orichalcos has a myriad of special abilities, but the most famous is that the loser of the duel will lose their soul. Upper Deck Entertainment was given copies of a promo card that had all the anime effects of the seal including the text that the loser loses their soul to the winner. However, soon after, the cards were all taken back after severing ties with Upper Deck. Fifteen copies of the card are known to exist in the possession of Upper Deck R&D, and are the only cards to mention the swapping of possession of souls. Oh. 
Oh my god, I'm so happy this list is finally over. I'm speaking candidly here, I don't have a script in front of me. I'm just saying that this took a lot of energy, a lot of writing. It took about uh, two days to write out the whole list with all the explanations and do all the research. It took me another two days to record this, and I'm only halfway done with editing at the time of finishing recording. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed the list. I tried to go into as much detail as I could and still make this a listenable length, but... If you made it to the end, thank you so much. Consider liking, subscribing, and follow at Yu-Gi-Oh! 7S on Twitter. They did all the hard work here. I got nothing else to say. Um, well, leave a comment if, you know, you learned something that you didn't know before, because learning is important. Uh, I'm going to go to bed before I finish up the editing on this part, so um, see you later.